people. Some new people. Uh, I was going to say it's good to see old faces, but that might be misunderstood. <laughs> and uh, I don't really mean old faces, but um, certainly since we all first met each other, so many things have happened, haven't they, in terms of what God has done and the things that we've been through, the things that we have experienced. Um, they are the things that uh, shape our lives, aren't they? Um, one is not shaped by continual blessing. One is shaped as you walk in the purposes of God and live with the things that you understand and live with the things that you don't understand uh, and declare in the midst of it all, he is the Lord. He's the Lord of what I understand and he's also the Lord of what I don't understand. And some of you uh, have walked through incredibly deep waters uh, but the Lord is faithful and his word is going to be fulfilled. And we've been around long enough to know uh, that uh, God works out his purposes. Although I do find that wisdom in retrospect is so much easier. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> it really is, isn't it? You sort of get a bit of a glimpse, you know, if you could actually get a little bit of an insight, it would be a lot more helpful, wouldn't it? But then we wouldn't walk by faith. See, we would not walk by faith. And I think for some of us, if we knew where we were going to go to, or knew some of the things that we were going to go through, I question whether we'd actually be willing to walk that way. And so, in some areas, it's good that the Lord actually hides those things from us. Otherwise, we'd be get overwhelmed. There's some literature at the back there. I don't spend a lot of time talking about that. But if you would like the update magazine, it comes free. And there's a little card there. Fill it in and just leave it on the, desk, on the table there. And we'll make sure that you get a copy. And uh, as well, you need to see me afterwards. Name and address of where you're going. And we'll send you some books and tapes, all right? Put you on the way there. Okay. Hallelujah. And there's two good books there. One is called Pray in the Price. God is speaking to us about prayer. And the other one is Lords of the Earth. Um, both very, very challenging books. I'm not going to say a lot about that. I'm going to get into what I want to say. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord's good, isn't he? And uh, will you turn your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 16. And uh, verse 3. If I said to you, uh, red sky at night, what would your answer be? Shepherd's delight. If I said to you, red sky in the morning, what would you say? Shepherd's warning. Okay. We have a little phrase here, don't we? Uh, that just gives us some understanding of how to be our own weather people. 16 verse 3. And in the morning today it will be stormy for the sky is red. See, the Bible's got it there long before we had it. <laughs> and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Jesus, he speaks to the people, he says, you look at the weather, you look at the sky, and you know what the weather's going to be like. But you fail to understand the signs of the times. We as a church need to understand what is happening, to understand the signs of the times. And I want to tell you, there is an increasing abundance of them. I mean, is it, any, is it by chance that all of a sudden there's been an upsurge in things like Celtic music? Church has been examining, looking at the whole thing of Celtic music and our roots and all those sorts of things. And then you see in sort of uh, popular music a whole upsurge of Celtic music. Why? Because the earth gets a feel of things. The tragedy often is that the church gets the feel way behind what the earth is feeling. <laughs> that we're sort of trailing on behind. But God is actually doing something among us whereby we no longer follow but we actually lead. Praise God. I think we're actually beginning to wake up to the fact that God's got purpose and plan. And if we'll tune in and listen and hear and look and observe the signs of the times, we'll actually be aware of what it is that he's beginning to do in the earth. We need to be a people of our day. We need to be hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying so that we are aware of what is going on. 
God is moving by his spirit in some remarkable ways. And I personally do not want to be the follower of history. I want to be the maker of history. All right, okay. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to be the follower of history. I want to be the maker of history. See, God's purposes in the earth are with the church. If you want to find out what God's plan is, have a look at the church. God is doing things with us, to us and for us. Because he has chosen to work through his body, you and me. He could have worked a million other ways. He could have put a tannoy system in the sky. You know, he, he has angels. He did that on the birth of Jesus, didn't he? There was the announcement for the shepherds to hear. Peace on earth, goodwill to all men. God's tannoy system. God speaks. He can speak if he wants to, but he has chosen to move incarnationally through his body. We are his hands, we are his feet, we are the people who are going to fulfil the purposes of our God in the earth. And if we don't do it, he will look for another generation who will. He doesn't have a plan B, he has only got plan A, us motley crew. That is all that he has got. Frail humanity, which he empowers by his Holy Spirit, which is the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. He says, I will empower you to do what I've called the body to do. I'm not going to leave you without power. I'm not going to leave you without authority. I'm not going to leave you hopeless and helpless. I've called you for a task, but I will equip you for the task that I've called you for. And God's grace will be sufficient to us as the body of Christ to fulfil the call of God that there is upon the church. And I for one want to say, Lord, I want to be in your purposes, I want to fulfil your purposes, I want to do your will and walk in obedience and in submission to you and to what you are seeking to do and what you are seeking to communicate to this world that is being enveloped in darkness. That the light may shine, that the light may come, and that the power and the presence and the testimony of our God will be released to the nations of the earth. The good news of the gospel will touch every tribe and every nation. That's what it's about. That's what we're here for. Okay? That's what we're here for. We're here that the nations and that every ethnic group may hear and know there is a God in heaven who loves and cares and gave his son and died and rose again that men might be free from the power of sin and that they might be cleansed and that they might have eternal life. That's what it's about. Thank God for our praise. Thank God for our worship. All of which endears us to him, causes us to know him, to walk in his presence, to be touched by him and moved by him. But in the end, our essential purpose of being here is to make him known to the nations of the earth. Otherwise, we could all just die and go to heaven, wherever heaven is. Which we all know by now, heaven is not up there. Okay. If heaven's up there and you live in Australia, you're in trouble. Because if you have to go up to heaven and you live in Australia, you have to go down to go up. Think about it, if the earth's round and you're at the bottom end. So God is doing things. And we need to understand, you see, so often we talk about March for Jesus. How many have been here and been on March for Jesus? Hey, I want to say something to you. When the next March for Jesus comes around, get on it. Get on it. You know why? Because you're part of history. One of the, one of the reasons, just one of them, I mean, I enjoy it anyway, but one of the reasons I'm going to I want to be in on history. And if God allows me time to come or whatever, I can look back and say, I was there. I didn't miss it. I was there. I was in on what God was doing. 12 million people taken to the streets in a 24-hour time frame is history-making. And we have to have a sense of the bigger picture of what God is doing. The danger is that in our understanding of local church, which I of course believe in and subscribe to, is that we can become so local that we become incestuous. That the only thing that we see is us and us few, and we don't realise that we're part of the fastest growing thing on the earth, and that thousands and thousands and thousands of people today are being added to our family, your family, my family, today coming into the kingdom of God. Don't talk about you ain't growing, you're growing faster than anything else on the face of the earth. You could get excited about that if you wanted to. I will allow it. See, the danger is that what we do is we look around and think, oh, here we are. 
But we have a witness and we have a testimony and we thank God for the few. No, no, no. I thank God for the few here, but I want to tell you, let's thank God for the many who will be added to the kingdom of our God today, of which we are a part, our family, because there is only one body and there is only one church of which we are all a part. Get excited about it. That today you are participating in something that is bigger than history has ever known. Glory. So when you begin to understand nations, when you begin to stay, understand the purposes of God in the earth, I mean, it's so exciting to see what God is doing. In small groups and in large, 80 million people in China who have come to Jesus. One nation alone. Tens of thousands of people who are being swept into the kingdom of our God. God is moving by his spirit. And to think that when we're taken to the streets of London, and here we are declaring that Jesus is the Lord, we are a few among 12 million people that are taken to the streets to declare Jesus is the Lord. That's why I like getting on March for Jesus. It's because I'm part of something that is happening around the globe. And although we don't understand it, I want to tell you, something in the atmosphere starts to change in a realm which we cannot see. See, it's like that old servant, wasn't it? He says to to the prophet, hey, you know, the enemy is all around us. He says, don't worry about it. Lord, open his eyes. And what he says, more are for us than are for them. Hallelujah. There's a lot more on our side than there is on theirs. Open his eyes, Lord, and let him see. And he sees the hosts of the armies of our God. Ooh, hallelujah. We are not a poor, motley little crew hanging on by our fingernails, hoping that Jesus comes soon. That is not what he's looking for. God is calling us to be a triumphant people who walk in his power and in his authority. That's what he's after. And things like March for Jesus, to think that in Sao Paulo alone in Brazil, two million people took to the streets. Two million Two million. I mean, to me, you know, this, I, I'm, I'm that kind of person, as you know, but those of you who know me, I mean, I'm thinking, Lord, let me get on a plane on March for Jesus Day. I want to see two million people on the streets in one go. Must be incredible. Can you imagine what it's like? I mean, I don't know how long it takes them to march past. I mean, but if there's two million of them, I should think it'd be there day and night. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And yet in my lifetime, when we used to have missionary prayer groups, you measured the number of Christians in South America in their thousands. I mean in the whole of South America. We're not talking about just Brazil. The whole of South America, you mentioned them in thousands, not in millions. In my lifetime. But by the end of this century, there will be over 100 million believers, evangelical believers, in South America alone. That's God breathing and moving. It's a sign of the time. Wake up, church. Realise what we're part of. Need to know that, see, there are signs of the times. The Berlin Wall coming down was a sign of the times. Nobody believed, least of all me, who went up to that time, up to those fences many times on the west side of Germany and looked over into the east and cried out to God, God in heaven, this is an affront to humanity. Do something about this wall. Do something about this fence. And we were caught by surprise and the wall came down. I don't understand it, but I do know this much, that the last prayer got prayed and God stepped out of heaven and did something. Why didn't he do it a year before? I don't know. He's God. Take it up with him. But you know, I remember one of the girls using an illustration where she had a glass and she was tapping it and she just tapped it and she just tapped it and she just tapped it and you know you just tap it and you just tap it but what's happening is something's happening in that glass that you can't see. You tap it, you tap it, you tap it, you tap it and then one time you tap it the same as you've tapped it a thousand other times and the glass shatters. The final tap is made and the glass shatters. And somehow, I don't understand it, but there in Berlin, the last hand was placed on that wall and God said, now! Now! The last tap was tapped on the wall. The last prayer was prayed. The last hand was placed on it. And the wall came down. 
Hallelujah. That's historical. The tragedy is the church did not discern the signs of the times and the first missionaries into East Germany were the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons who were ready, trained, fluent in German and went into the nation. And the first magazine was not a Christian magazine, it was Playboy. Why? Because the church did not discern the signs of the times. And it's the same with Russia now, where the door of opportunity is opening. How long it's going to stay open, we do not know. But we are so lazy and so sleepy in our attitude and approach. We must learn to discern what is happening. But who could have believed? Who could have believed there would have been? And that's why we must continue to pray for the situation in Northern Ireland. We are in a spiritual battle. You see, when peace was starting to come together, the church sits back and says, there, you know, there it is, done that one. Let's get on to the next thing. But it is not so. There is a battle going on for Northern Ireland. We must continue to pray and discern the signs of the times. Here is a nation that releases more resources and more people into missions work probably than any other nation, certainly in the Western world. In one denomination alone that I know of, in Northern Ireland, they are 20% of that denomination. They give 80% of the missionary offerings. Is it any, any wonder why the enemy wants to keep that thing boiling? Hmm? Why? Because it hinders the resources for the kingdom of God's sake. We must discern the signs of time. We've got to discern what is happening. We've got to pray with some strategy, insight and understanding. We're not talking about a few people putting their guns down. We're talking about the kingdom of God coming. Who could have believed in South Africa? Who would have believed that a man who spent almost all of his life in prison? If you ever read the, the book, if you can get it and read it and take your way to A Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela, it's a stirring book. You can't wonder. It's a miracle that that man did not come out with anger and hatred and bitterness in his heart and said, that's it, all white people finished. Nobody expected the man to come out and speak peace and reconciliation. So we've had enough is enough is enough. We must work together. South Africa, such an influential country in terms of world mission. We must understand the strategy, the signs of the times. Who would have believed that Yasser Arafat... And the Israeli government would be found in the same room. You see, we must pray. We need to be praying for those situations now. How it's been sought to be disturbed. Interesting enough, listen to this. On the 18th of May, 1986, this was a diary entry in a lady's, uh, she kept a journal. Right. And she wrote this for, what is it, four, five years? 86, when did they start speaking? Three, four years ago? So we're talking at least five or six years. This lady wrote this in her diary. This is a photograph of a diary entry. The pastor has looked at it so that you know that she hasn't written it, written it subsequent to the event, because that's easy, isn't it? She wrote it prior to, and this is what she wrote. Do you think God's doing something in the earth? Listen, this is a lady who sits in the congregation who hears from the Lord. I saw a vision of a room with several men. They were dressed in Arab and Palestinian clothing, definitely Middle Eastern. This lady lives in America, I should add, in Detroit. No, she lives in Minnesota. They were sitting in a large room filled with lots of papers, maps, and having animated conversations. I'm sure one was Yasser Arafat, the Palest uh, she had Palestinian clothing, and he was yelling and stomping his fists. During one conversation, he left the room and then came back. Through the whole vision, there appeared to be very dramatic and animated sessions of discussion. Several of the men had on Western-type clothing. I looked for Middle East. They looked, but they looked Middle Eastern. I believe they are Israeli, but I do not recognise any powers in the little hat they have. There doesn't appear to be any major American representation, but I definitely feel that they are peace talks of some kind. This is 1986. After praying about this, the Lord spoke to me that there would be some very pivotal events. It was 1993. Pivotal events in Israel in the fall of 93. There will be major 
events both to the world and in the spiritual realm. I believe these indicate a peace treaty signed by Israel and the PLO. Okay, 1983, she's writing this in 1986. That should be a major significant event, she puts exclamation mark. That's an understatement. I believe the Lord said that there would take place in the fall, I believe in September, in actual fact it was uh, beginning of October, she was about three weeks out. And around or during Rosh Hashanah, and I believe that Jordan and possibly Syria will somehow be involved, but I'm not sure how. Could this be the beginning of the utterance, peace, peace, etc.? You think God's doing something? Speaking to people, touching people, seven years before an event, a lady sitting in Minnesota writes in her diary about something you think, impossible. What are you talking about? Yes, sir, if that sit down with Israel, you can forget it. No way. Some of you will have heard of uh, uh, the magazine Plain Truth. Anybody seen the magazine Plain Truth? You used to get this free magazine, didn't you, by Ben Armstrong. Everybody used to go get this Plain Truth. And it was kind of a mixture of Seventh Adventism, um, British Israelism, and 101 other things. This guy seemed to incorporate everything. Ben Armstrong, the man who started it all, died. His son took over. God spoke to his son. His son actually left the movement, pulled out of it because it was a false step, pulled out of it, established a church, has 6,000 people now in his church. The interesting thing is, you see, God loves people far more than we do. And so what happens? The man who takes over, God begins to speak to him. So here he is, the head now of this huge, great organisation. And he makes this declaration. We must get back to the truth of what the Bible teaches and says as opposed to what it is we now believe. Can you believe that? Even amongst the Jehovah Witnesses, God is pouring out his spirit. Can't say that. Yes, you can. Why? Because God is more concerned about people's hearts. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the Jehovah's Witnesses are right. They're in error. But you see, God looks on the human heart within the Jehovah's Witness movement, although it and of itself teaches error. There are those who are searching after God. And if a man or a woman will seek God, God says, you seek me, you will find me. See, in my lifetime again, you, we could never conceive from the background I come, you would never conceive that any Roman Catholic could ever possibly, ever, ever get into the kingdom of God. There was no way, Jose, it was not going to happen. I had every horror, horror story you can imagine in every book there was written on the horror stories of the Roman Catholic Church. See, I started to meet some. Then I was in a real trouble. Because they were blessed of God, anointed by his Holy Spirit. I thought, I like these people. <laughs> this ain't supposed to happen. Now please hear me, that doesn't make the Roman Catholic Church right. What it does say is that within that, where people's hearts will be after God and seek the face of the Lord, God will move by his Spirit. See, there is signs of the times. God is beginning to do things. When you think that even amongst the Mormons, Ravi Zacharias, probably the leading um, apologetics ministry we've got, such a clear, anointed, even jellical man, one of the best apologetic ministers there is in the world, I would say in Christendom, is sitting in the centre with all the leaders of the Mormon church in Salt Lake City, Utah, and he's dialoguing with them about the authenticity of the word of God and who Jesus is, etc., etc. You tell me God can't do things? That doesn't make the Mormons right. But what it does mean is that within that, there are people whose hearts are after God. Signs of the times. You think what is happening in Argentina? Argentina lost the war over the Falkland Islands. In one sense you have to say, thank God they did. The privilege was theirs that they lost. You know why? Because Argentina turned to God. In its despair, in its humiliation. Because they thought that they were going to win. They actually sought God. And God has moved in revival fire in Argentina. 
where in one city 80,000 people came to Jesus in one week and the churches grew from 50 to 2,000 in seven days. Can you imagine the kind of problems you have? You know, you imagine us sitting here this Sunday and next Sunday we've got 2,000 people outside the door. In order to be saying we ain't got enough croissants for them all. <laughs> and the only way to get me in the buildings was actually take all the furniture out and everybody was standing up like this shoulder to shoulder. They said, anybody could get me in? All like this. Worship me the Lord's Lord. Couldn't get me in. And my friend went there to one of these churches. He said, you know, <laughs> he said, what day is the meeting? He said, every day. He said, what time? All the time. So he said, what do I do? He said, turn up. So that was it. And so he goes to the building, he said, and as he walked into this building, he said he fell on the floor. He said he could not walk in the building. There was no way he could not walk in the building because of the power and the presence of God in that building. Where there is 23 hours of prayer, praise and worship. Seven days a week. They start at one o'clock in the morning, they go right the way through to 12 midnight, take one hour to clean the building up and start again. He said it was like walking into, he said it was walking into heaven. He said there's no other way you could describe it than you walk into the tangible presence of God. And in the local prisons, God is moving by his spirit. And the interesting thing is here in Great Britain, God is moving by his spirit. Isn't it funny that people who are in prison actually are freer than those that are out of it. God is moving, there's a revival happening in our prisons. Hundreds and hundreds of prisoners are coming to Jesus. The wind of God is blowing. Church, we need to wake up to what is happening. There's something on the move. I don't know if you're getting a message, I don't know if you're hearing anything here, but something's happening. God is going to do it. He'll do it with us or without us. It's not be involved in it, isn't it? But you've got men like Cabrera and Condia, Silvoso and others who are going into those situations there in Argentina and praying and believing that God will break open those spiritual realms that they might live under an open heaven. That's what Yomni Cho says. The reason why we're as successful in Seoul, Korea is because we now live under an open heaven. And those of us who have ministered, you know when it happens. I know, I've been in situations where all of a sudden you are conscious that you have broken through and that you are living under an open heaven. It's the scariest place to be, I want to tell you. Because whatever you do somehow, God anoints you. It's a scary place. I had it once when I was in Florida. And all of a sudden as we were praying, you knew the heavens opened up. Something broke. I heard a crack in the heavens. It's the only way I can describe it. Something went, mm, broke. And I tell you, I mean, I was drunk as anything. I had two big guys marching me around the church. And sure, if it was go down the line that way, they'd have to sort of... And these guys would carry me because I couldn't walk. I was so drunk. They said, pray for people. So I put me up. I couldn't lift my arm up. So they lift my arm up like this. So I'm standing there with these two hefty guys, one on either side, with my hand being held like that. And I go... And they go, bang! <laughs> fall on the floor. Not 100 of them. We had 500 at one time, all on the floor. They had nothing to do with me. I will tell you, they had nothing to do with me. All I did was go, that was it. That's God. That's God. When you ain't doing it, God does it. Oh, oh hallelujah. I tell you. Now, I don't know if you know, but God has been doing something. You may have heard it. Signs of the times. We must be aware of the signs of the times in that area. We must be aware of the demographical changes. We know, you and I know, good gracious, like Barking's changed in the last 35 years, isn't it? Now, if we're still trying to preach the same way we did 35 years ago, we are irrelevant and hopelessly out of date. Aren't we? I mean, to start with, the ethnic grouping has changed. It doesn't change in Dagnum, but they'll get there. But here in Barking, it has changed. Now, we've got to be aware of it. We need to be sensitive to it. We need to understand what is the Holy Spirit saying. 
The national economy is changing. The issues are changing. Green issues have come onto the agenda. People are more conscious about what happens to dolphins and whales than there are babies in the womb. Church, we've got to be aware of it. We need to be sensitive to what is happening and read both the blessed signs of the times and the cursed signs of the times. What kind of world is it when, when we are deciding as to what twin in the womb will live or die? You start playing God. Where does it end? And if we'd had that sort of thing between 1939 and 1945, they would have been in serious crime. They, they would have finished up being on trial. Things are happening which we need to be aware of. Signs of the times. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but there's a place called Toronto. It has kind of brought some emphasis around. Now we need to understand that Toronto is only part of what God is doing in the earth. You know, 80 million Chinese people have come to the Lord and don't even know where Toronto is. You know, I go to Ghana, West Africa. Grace was there three years ago preaching at a conference, 70,000 women. Planted last year, 400 new churches. In 55 years, have planted 5,300 churches, 400 churches, in Ghana alone. One million people on a Sunday will be found in their churches, and there are only 14 million in the whole of the country. And most of those won't know where Toronto is. Now that's not, please don't hear me, that is not to make fun of Toronto, it is to put it in its context that it is part of what God is doing in the earth. But I want to tell you, it is part of what God is doing in the earth. You may not like that, but it is. It may not please you, but it is. For the sake of time, I won't read it, 1 Kings 19, you know the story about the prophet Elijah. He just slaughtered all the prophets of Baal and he goes on the run and he's hiding himself in a cave and then the wind and the earthquake and the fire come. Do you remember that? Interesting enough when he hears all of those and then he hears the voice of God, God says to him, what are you doing here? Go back to where you came. That's been a very significant word for me. But the wind, the earthquake and the fire. And I want to tell you with all that is happening, a whole load of shaking is going on for the people of God. And if you're not aware of it, I don't know where you've been. But it seems to me, certainly with my contemporaries, wherever I go, I can't tell you. It is true. We keep hearing it hackneyed phrase, though it is from the tale of two cities. It is the best of times and it is the worst of times. If ever that epitomises my testimony, that does. And I think it's true of many others, is it not? (laughs) The best of times and the worst of times. Never known such as the power and the presence of God. Never been so confused, so shaken, so disturbed in all my life. One man said, you know, you go through periods of, you know, of of times when uh, it's sort of a bit of a rough ride. And then you go through the calm. I said, excuse me, mine's sort of a, um, mine's daily. What do you do about it when it's daily? I'm going through periods of time. I'm going up, down, up. It's like living on a switchback. My life's been like living on a switchback. It really has. I think God in heaven can have a bit of stability for for something longer than 24 hours. Might be helpful. You know, 31 years now, Grace, and I planted a church in, in East London there. I have never known such shaking as what's happening now. I cannot tell you every single reference point in my life has been shaken. I cannot think of one single thing in my life. Not one single relationship that we have that has not been shaken. Not one. Whether it is in my ministry, whether it is in my relationships, whether it is in our finances, whatever it is, I cannot think of one solitary area in my life that has not been shaken by God. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. God is moving with the air wind, the earthquake and the fire. Will you turn to Psalm 104? Now we need to understand this church. And hopefully this will help us to understand. Psalm 104 verse 4. And he makes winds his messenger as flames of fire his servant. Psalm 104 verse 4. Now you notice something. What is it? The wind is the messenger, it is not the message. 
All right? The wind is the messenger, it is not the message. Laughing, crying, shaking, shivering, jumping, jerking, and all the other things that go on to so many of us that don't ask us to explain it. They in and of themselves are not the message. All right? They are not the message. They are a phenomena. Most biblical phenomena is to grab your attention. God is out to grab the attention of the church. And if you get caught up with phenomena, it will come and it will go. And in many places, tragically, it has. What has happened is, what's next? What's the next thing we're supposed to do? What's the next thing we're supposed to feel? And the tragedy is, we have not said, what is God trying to say to us in all of this? What is God trying to communicate to us as a church in terms of the outpouring of his Holy Spirit in Toronto, blessing or whatever way you want? And don't get, don't get all fussed about whether you call it Toronto, blessing for goodness sakes. We don't, we, we don't get fussed when we talk about the Welsh revival, do we? Why? Why do we call it the Welsh Revival? Because it was in Wales, for goodness sakes. Well, why weren't we worried about whether you called it a Toronto blessing? Why? Because most of it started in Toronto. Pretty logical, isn't it? It'll take a lot of working out. It's so fussed about it all. Don't get fussed about whether it's Toronto blessing or any other blessing, get the name of it. All I want to say to you is discern the signs of the times. And what I've learned is find out where the river's flowing and get in on it. That's what I've learned. As far as I'm concerned now, I've gotten to the place, Lord, I said, God, whatever it takes, whatever it goes, wherever it is, I want it, whatever it may be. And if that means I have to be ridiculous, then God, give me grace to be ridiculous, but by your grace, I want to be in it. I'm past caring now, quite frankly. I'm so fed up with everything else that is around me. I'm past caring. God, I just want your blessing. I want you to move. I want to see my dreams fulfilled. I want to see your blessing and I want to see this nation and the nations of the earth one for you. That's what I want. And if it takes me on the floor, laughing or crying or shaking or shivering or jumping and jerking, so be it. So be it. But we need to understand that the wind or manifestations in and of themselves are the messenger, they are not the message. So something is happening. The wind of God has blown or is blowing in some cases because it doesn't happen in blocks, you know. Nation wind. Nation earthquake. Nation fire. It doesn't work like that, does it? You, know, you might be having the wind blowing on you and somebody else is stuck in an earthquake. But it doesn't work. It all kind of in blocks and lumps. It does do it in terms of communities at times. But even then, we don't all walk at the same pace. But the wind is blowing. I don't know if you're aware of it, the wind is blowing. And one thing I've learned, I found, a, I found myself preaching about the wind of God. You know what I am? Every time I started to preach about the wind of God, I'm, I'm going around like this. I'm going, oh. I, I preached, I, I was in America. <laughs> I was in America every single morning. We had these early morning prayer meetings. I spent every single morning walking along like this. People saying, something wrong with your back? Is there something wrong with your back? It's so, so funny, isn't it? Is there something wrong with your back? And I'm going, no, no, no. I, I don't understand this, but I've got... This, it, it, well, why are you walking like that? Because we've got to bend with the wind. We've got to bend with the wind. You know, do you want to take something for it? <laughs> no, it's not that kind of wind, thank you. <laughs> I've got to bend with the wind. You know why? Because you don't bend with the wind, you're not hands. It'll break you. If a tree doesn't bend with the wind, it breaks. And I want to tell you, God would much rather bend you than break you. But if you won't bend, he will actually break you. Because he loves us. If you don't actually bend, you'll find yourself broken. And I'm going, Lord... I'm bending. <laughs> I quit now. <laughs> Give up. <laughs> I'm bending. So I'm going around all these meetings going, Oh Lord, if you don't, if you don't bend with the wind, you're going to break. All these people laughing at me. I, think, Lord, I said, Lord, they're all laughing at me. Did you let them laugh? That's it. You're just going to do it. And I said, I feel so stupid. That's fine. <laughs> so God doesn't enter into discussions. 
You know, Lord, I feel stupid. He goes, okay. So I said, well, ain't there anything else? No. So there were no discussions about it. Just obedience. So, Lord, could I have a word from you? No. <laughs> you just, just bend. <laughs> but the wind is blowing. And the interesting thing is, have you noticed, we won't go into it all, we don't have the time, but there's the north wind, the south wind, the east wind and the west wind. If you look at our morning scripture, it's very interesting what those winds have to say to us. West wind brings the rain. And the north wind brings the cold. The east wind is dry. The south wind is hot. But you ever notice that the trouble is as well that, you know, <laughs> you're dry and the person beside you happens to be wet. You ever notice that? That comes we can't all be dry together. Why is it you, you've got husband and wife, haven't you? You've got one, I mean, you know, one's enjoying the blessing of God, falling all over the place, prayer of God, and you're as dry as old sisters. And then God in heaven, what's happening here? Because he's God, he'll do it whatever way he wants to do it. But in the end, he's the Lord. He's the Lord, and the wind's going to blow, and he'll blow it whatever way he wants to, whether it's hot, cold, or otherwise. He'll blow it, he's going to blow on us. You may find yourself in some of the coldest times you've ever experienced. You may find yourself in the coldest time of your experience when that wind begins to blow. And I want to tell you, don't keep on saying this is the devil. I often find we blame the devil with far too much. It's all part of the purposes of God. He's saying, do you love me because of what I do, or do you love me because of who I am? Get it sorted out, church. Hmm? You're going to find it. I want to tell you, you're going to find it. That wind is going to blow. And for some, it'll be nice and gentle and refreshing. And for others, it'll blow them over. And for some, it'll blow them away. You know, when Toronto hit our church in uh, 1994... We were all on the floor laughing, enjoying God. The power of the Lord was moving. We actually literally had a wind blow through our church, blew and filed right across the hall, out through the side doors, and three other guys went out with him and all finished up a heap in the corridor. I mean, like a wind, just a wind. It blew, blew them along the ground. I have never seen anything like I was hanging on to people to try and stand up. I was walking around like a drunk man, pointing at people and all this sort of thing. And so I, you know, more than enough. I would have myself crying one minute and laughing in the other and all these sorts of things that happened. And the wind of God blows and what tremendous blessing it was and then all of a sudden everything hit the fan. Sin got revealed in our church. You can't believe it. People were saying, we can't live with this. This is God among us. Such sin that absolutely, I tell you, you have to find yourself, how can this be? How can this be? But God's after a purified people. And we, he's not winking at it anymore. I want to tell you, he ain't going to let us get away with it. He's, not going to, he's looking for the people that are willing to go through. But then the shaking comes. He starts to shake us. And what does the Hebrews 11 talk about? Hebrews 12, he says, what? I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. Why? So that that which is of me will remain. I'm going to shake it. You feel shaken? God, oh, I tell you, God's shaking me. I thought my was going to fall off. I did. I did. I thought, my, I thought my head was going to fall off. God's trying to shake me. And then I find myself literally shaking. Can't keep still. You, found me. you can't keep still. I mean, people talk to we were, we were, we, I was I, I'd go to America and some people say to us, um, tell us what's happening. I, I mean, it was just, that was the worst thing we could do. If we started to talk about it, it was real trouble. And so I'm sitting, I'm sitting at this dinner table. Where put, none of these people have seen anything of Toronto before. And I'm, and I'm sitting at the dinner table, and here I am, I'm going. <laughs> I'm shaking, my grace is going, stop, stop. I can't, I can't stop. I said, I can't stop. Every time I start, ooh, 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 ooh. I'm trying to get things out and then I'm going, I'm going, um, um, uh, and, and uh, well, w- uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I can't get the words out. I'm stuttering over the words and they're laughing at me. Going, oh, God, you know, how do I get into these situations? Get me out of here as quick as you can. I'm sitting in the middle, I go, oh, Lord, I think I'm mad. I'll get me committed at this rate. What's going on here? I think, Lord, but in the end, if it takes, if that's what it takes to shake, will you just have to shake me? 
Shake me, shake me, shake me. Shake everything that can be shaken. So that whatever, ever, ever it is that can be shaken, it's going to be shaken. I mean, you start looking through scriptures about the whole thing of, 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 of earthquakes. I mean, you, there's amazing things how God starts to speak through shaking. How oh, they're shaking. He says, it's, he, says, he said, in the last days, what's it going to be like? He said, it's going to be like, see, don't get worried when people are on the floor, you know, in a sort of a fetal position. They're going, oh, oh. You've seen some of that? Yeah, I've seen some of that. Well, look, we don't need to be surprised. The Bible talks about that in the last days, he said, it will be what? Like a woman in travail. Huh? Now I understand, I haven't seen it myself, other than the film, my wife going to me, time, let me finish with my story. <laughs> Love you. So, okay. We have a child, here we are, pregnant. Nine, have you ever noticed that when, when women are pregnant, nine, you know, when they get to about nine months, they don't know, well, just sit, do they? Can't get comfortable. Do you feel like that? Church is pregnant with something and they can't get comfortable. And you sort of, Get this way, you get that way, don't you? See the lady in the game. What's wrong, love? I can't get comfortable. There's something up there. I'll be glad when I can give birth to it. I'll get to the edge of this. But the thing is... <laughs> well, church is a bit like that, and it? Kind of... Can't get comfortable. Not quite sure what we want, when we want it, how we want it, or whatever we else we want to do. But there is something that is growing inside of us, the church, something inside of us that we know has not yet been born, but is going to be born. So, and the tragedy is that if you bring it too soon, you only produce weakness and at times death. You have to go to full time in order for there to be health and vitality. God has set nine months. Now, there are many women who would like it to be one month. One's, many women who would like it to be one week. You know, there's nothing worse is there every morning. It's going, it's all right, love, you know, you'll be happy about it. You'll rejoice. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, you'll be happy when you have a son or a daughter. Happy. No, you don't feel happy. You feel awful. So here we are struggling with this sort of thing. And then finally, you feel the twinge. It's now. Okay. So off we go. We get in the car. We're in the hotel. Uh, up to the hospital. Here we are. Hospital, not hotel. We're in the hospital. My wife's having a baby. And so she jumps up on the table. Oh, baby's pointing. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's all over. Two minutes flat. Here we go. Didn't quite happen like that, did it? And it's kind of on the table and, ah! And they go, push, I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. Push them on, man, breathe on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darling, wouldn't it be wonderful? You know, next time we'll have a little boy, next time we'll be next time. <laughs> oh, no. And it's always kind of, Then the baby's born. And all the pain is quickly forgotten. And Jesus said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the pain. He endured the cross. Why? So he could hold a baby in his arms. You and me. That's what it was all about. He endured the pain. So that that last day he could hold in his arms, arms you and me. He says, and then it was joy. And church, if we are willing to go through, there will be joy. But we've got to go through the pain. We've got to go through the shaking. We've got to go through the fire. And when that fire comes, it will consume everything that can be consumed. And all I can tell you is I don't know, but I know that God is dealing with me. A few months ago, all my reference points somehow got changed and shattered. I found myself thinking, I'm going to drive my car into a lamppost. I can't cope with it anymore. I've had enough. 
I'll find myself under a train. Those of you who know me know that I'm not like that. I got so desperate, I thought, God in heaven, where are you? What in the world is going on? What is happening here? Get me out of here. See, when the fire comes, we've got our preconceived ideas of how it should be on it. We get it all sorted out, and then God goes, <coughs> think, Lord, I've been around 35 years. What are you talking about? <coughs> you gave me a drink. <coughs> Dead Norman, there's only one thing that's going to keep you. Sing an old song. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flood that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Songs like this, power, power, wonder working power. I began to realise that in the end my only protection was the blood of Jesus my only place was at the foot of the cross and that in the end it was that he was going to blow with his wind he was going to shake my life he was going to bring his fire and he said Norman if there's anything left thank you Jesus because whatever it takes I want to press around if it means I have to walk folded over, if it means I shake like a leaf on a tree, or I feel the heat so much at times I think, Lord, get me out of this world. Give me the grace to walk through. That's the only prayer I've got now. The only prayer that I've got left is, Lord, all I ask for you is that whatever it is you want to do, do it. But give me the grace to walk through. That's all I can pray. I just find myself praying it again and again. Lord, you can do what you want to do. But please give me the grace to walk through. Because if I haven't got the grace to walk through, are you going to make it? And make it. Let the wind blow. Let the wind blow. Just feel the wind. Let the wind blow. Just let the wind blow. Let the wind blow. Let the refreshing wind blow. Let the refreshing wind blow. Sometimes it's gentle and sometimes it's really strong. God by his Holy Spirit determines how it's going to be. And you know, for some of you, you need to get under a canopy. For some of you, the enemy has come and sought to destroy you. You need to know that your only protection is not going to be King Sam. It's not going to be the fellowship. Thank God for friends and thank God for fellowship. But your only protection is the blood of Jesus. That's all you've got. God somehow has taken us right back. And for some of you, you need to just get under it. So I want to say to you, the enemy is after the promises that he's given to you. He's after the prophetic words that you've received that for some of you seem further away today than the day when God first gave them. But the interesting thing is that every day that Abraham lived and he seemed to get farther away from the promises that God gave to him, from God's perspective, he was actually each day getting nearer and nearer and nearer. And this Sunday, I want to declare to you, you're actually one week nearer to the fulfilment of God's word to you than you were last Sunday. Not one week further away. From God's perspective, you are one week nearer. What are you going to choose? What are you going to choose to believe? Whom are you going to choose to believe? The Bible says, let God be true and everything else a lie. But what God said, God has said. So I just sense that there are those of you, just quickly, the next few minutes, 
Some of you need to get under it. Just get under it. Come on out. Get under it. Let God do something for you. Let God touch you afresh. Because I want to tell you, God is after robbing you of your dreams. He's after stealing from you those promises. He is a thief and a robber. He hasn't changed any. Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.